Amen. Thank you. Be seated. <clears throat> Take your Bible if you would. I agree with the songwriter. I scarce could take it in myself. <coughs> Genesis chapter 13. <coughs> we'll begin reading in verse 7. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen. For we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan. Then it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Now, you've got the edge of the Mediterranean Sea. And you've got an area here, uh, a coastline. Then you've got a very hilly region the hills of Judea up to Nazareth you got the Sea of Galilee and you've got the Jordan River winding down through this nice valley now today this comes into a large area called the Dead Sea but before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah the Jordan River probably as it does today probably meandered through this whole valley and it was a great and then over here you have a wilderness area but this would be the Jordan Valley on down through and uh, I don't know where the Jordan would have gone it's possible there was a Dead Sea but it was a much smaller area the seas of Sodom and Gomorrah were around where the Dead Sea is now and it's probably why just south of the Dead Sea there is the lowest spot on the earth God pounded them with fire and brimstone into ash and uh, created a area where there's no outlet. Most likely here, the outlet would have continued on through before God pounded a hole in the ground. So Lot looks down. Abraham and Abraham's up in here. Jerusalem is uh, right around in here. You got Bethel. Uh, you got the different cities. Nazareth would be up here. But in Abraham's time, this was the hill country of Judea and the Philistines usually got the coastline later in later years but Lot and Abraham were in the hill country there and it's, it's beautiful but it's not as nice as this well watered plain grassland down below and Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan so which way did he go and then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan and Lot journeyed east well yeah that's he went down the hill here uh, into the the plains of Jordan and they separated themselves the one from the other Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan which was the hill er hilly area and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly and the Lord said unto Abram after that Lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it, thee, give it unto thee. Then Abraham removed his tent, and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Hebron's just south of Jerusalem. Um, so, in chapter 13, Abraham chooses to separate from Lot, and he gives Lot the choice. 
Lot looks for the well-watered plain of Jordan and pitches his tent towards Sodom. Abraham goes down to Hebron and builds an altar to God. Abraham is seeking God's program. Lot is seeking his own program. Abraham's building an altar and Lot's building a business. Abraham is seeking, in, in, in our day and age, it would be Abraham looking for a godly church and Lot looking for a good job. Abraham looking for heavenly advantages and Lot looking for earthly advantages. We find in Genesis 14 that there's a battle. Uh, Lot was looking for things that earthly men also look for. And he went where the rich people were and became a target. And when Keter Lamer and all his buddies came up, they began to attack where they knew they would find gold and where they would find riches and where they would find what they were looking for. And Lot happened to be in that bunch. And all those things that Lot pursued in life were taken away from him because that was what these men also pursued in life. Abraham, up in the hill country, had separated his family. They were not living by the, the city. They were away from the city. It was harder to make a living up there in the hill country, but it was uh, more conducive for building an altar and walking with God. It was more conducive for raising children away from the, the sinfulness of the city. The reason that Sodom was so sinful is because of their prosperity and ease. The Bible says the sin of Sodom was fullness of bread and abundance of idleness. And that led to uh, their promiscuity, their immorality, their ungodliness, their arrogance, their pride, their separation from God. You may have felt your need a little more for building an altar if you lived in the hill country and had to pray your way through the year. But down there in the well-watered plains of Jordan, everything was all taken care of and you didn't need God anymore. So you looked for, you, you, you got by on less uh, work and you had more time to goof off. And so you looked for something to goof off in and you ended up in trouble. Uh, the old saying, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. And that is so true. So, Abraham up there in the hills, he has 318 servants. And we've got Abraham up there in the hills. And not only are they building an altar to God, he's providing a future for his home. And in providing a future for his home, he's training his servants and making weapons for his servants. There may have been some some living out in the country you may have had to defend yourself a little more aptly than if you were living by a big city down there the city folk would help take care of you maybe you could run and shut the gates but up there in the country living in a tent you had to maybe be a little more prepared for an attack uh, uh, drive away the, the wild beast from your sheep or whatever it might be and so he trained his servants they all had weapons they all knew how to use their weapons and so when the king's came up and conquered the soft city folks, the rough country folk up there decided to band together and go deliver these soft city folk from uh, their problems. And so they did. They gathered together. These rough and rugged shepherds all got together with Mamre and the, the, the brothers of Eskel. And they went after these kings and uh, whooped up on them and delivered Lot. And they came back and Abraham was the leader of the Confederacy and he came back and the uh, king of Salem Melchizedek and the New Testament calls him the king of righteousness and the king of peace and it's so uh, interesting and uh, symbolic that the king of righteousness and the king of peace that was his name that was that was who he was okay made like unto the son of God came out and blessed Abraham after the slaughter of the kings. Read it in Hebrews there. Mm -hmm. After he came back from the slaughter of these wicked kings who were, who were carrying away captives and, and subduing people, uh, the king of righteousness and the king of peace came out and blessed him. And Abraham tithed a tenth of all the spoils to Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God. And then after he gave a tithe of everything, then he gave all the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah back their goods and said, I don't want even a shoe latchet because I don't want you to think you made Abraham rich. I don't, want, I don't want anything of yours. I just wanted to pay tithes of all that you haven't paid tithe on for all these years. I wanted to make sure God got his portion and then you can have the rest of the stuff back. I don't want it. And, uh, but Melchizedek blessed him. 
he lifted up his hand to the Lord that he would not take any of their ill-gotten gains and their worldly goods. That was quite an example for his son, for his family, for his servants. He was saying, I don't want the riches of this ungodly bunch. I rescued them. That was the right thing to do. I rescued Lot. But I don't want anything to do with their lifestyle. We have a true man of God here. Turn to Genesis 15 there. And after these things, the word of the Lord. Who's that? That's Jesus. He was the word that became flesh. The word of Jehovah came unto Abram, Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. What does that mean? Well, let me ask you a question. What do you want as your portion in this life? You've got one life. You might have 70 years. You may not. We've heard of a number of people getting killed lately and people, uh, you know, their health failing them. I mean, it's all around. It's all the time. Whether they're old or young or middle-aged, it doesn't matter. But while you've got health and while you've got time, what do you want in life? What do you want to say, this is my portion. This is what I'm going to pursue. If I get this, I will be happy. Abraham chose God as his portion. Abraham had a life as well. Abraham said, I want God for my portion. And he pursued God. He went where God told him to go. He did what God told him to do. He lived according to the laws that God set. And God said, I. You gave all those riches back. You gave a tenth there. You, you uh, did your duty. But you didn't get rich and powerful over this situation. Because he wanted God as his portion. And the Lord came to him in chapter 15 to let him know, Indeed, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. You don't need the riches of Sodom. You don't need what Lot was looking for. I am your portion. This is the choice of all who have the faith of Abraham. The faith of Abraham is boiled down to when Abraham chose what he wanted out of life, he said, I want God. Mm -hmm. God is my portion. Um, there's a, a song beneath the cross of Jesus. And the last verse says, I take the cross and shadow for my abiding place. I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of His face. Content to let the world go by, to know no gain or loss, my sinful self, my only shame, my glory, all the cross. Are you content to let the world go by? I've asked that numerous times. But what that means is, we're defining it a little better for you this morning, hopefully. Maybe give you a little different uh, shade from the prism the light shines through. You are going to make a decision what you want in life. Lot looked at the well-watered plains of Jordan. He thought, I want to have, I want to be a productive shepherd. I want to have riches. I want to have ease. I want to have comfort. I want to have wealth. I want to have power. You know, what, what do you want in life? You want romance and, and the pleasure? You want to have fun and adventure? Or you want God? As a youth of 15, I had tried a little bit of the world's adventure. Rodeo, whatnot. I had, had, I had seen all the options out there. I saw what the world had to offer. At 15 years old, one night, I chose God as my portion. There are times in my life when I wondered, did I miss out on something? Turn to Psalm 73. Asaph had that experience. So what if I choose God as my portion? I give my life to God. I live for God. I serve God. I seek God. Everything in my life is all about God now and doing God's will. There's a number of things that you have to let go by mm -hmm. as a young man, as a, uh, uh, 
a young man, as a married man, as a middle-aged man, as an older man. Uh, if God is going to be your portion, you can't have both. You can't have God as your portion and this world as your portion. You're going to have to choose what you want for your portion. In Psalm 73, Asaph shares a very, a very personal event in his life in a matter of a psalm. And I think that the Holy Spirit in leading him to pin these words understands that many of the righteous, many people who choose God as their portion in this life Sometimes stop and look around at everything the world has to offer and they wonder. Wow, looks like, looks like everybody else is enjoying their portion out there. They lose sight of their original decision and why they made it. He says, truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain, violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness, they have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people, God's people, return hither, and the waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain, and washed my hands in innocency. For all day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say, I will speak thus, Behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. In other words, he felt like, I can't share my inner feelings. I don't want someone to stumble. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Down deep inside, he was struggling with maybe, maybe it's not the right choice. Maybe I am missing out. I don't see these people getting thumped on the head, going their direction. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. The chances of those people repenting and knowing God and going to heaven is almost nil. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed in terrors. As a dream when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reign. So foolish was I, and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart. And my what? Say it. Portion. Portion. My portion forever. God is my portion. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. God is my portion. In Psalm 73 25, uh, it says, I desire none upon earth beside thee. When I have the Lord, I have every good thing. Do you know why? Because He is the source of good. James says every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And then cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Psalm 84, 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will He withhold from them that walk uprightly. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. If God is the fountain of good, if God is the fountain of every good and perfect gift, then when I have God as my portion, I am not missing out on anything that's good. 
I'm only missing out on that which would not be good. Right. David, when he's being persecuted by Saul, trying to do what was right, seeking God as his portion. And yet, things weren't working out too well. Psalm 17, he says, Hear the right, O Lord, attend unto my cry. Give ear unto my prayer that goeth not out of feigned lips. Let my sentence come forth from, my, from thy presence. Let thine eyes behold the things that are equal. Thou hast proved my heart. Thou hast visited me in the night. Thou hast tried me and shalt find nothing. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. Concerning the works of men, by the word of thy lips I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. Hold up thy, uh, my goings in thy paths, that my footsteps slip not. I have called upon thee, for thou wilt hear me, O God. Incline thine ear unto me, and hear my speech. Show thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand them that put their trust in thee, from those that rise up against them. Keep me as the apple of thine eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings, from the wicked that oppress me, from my deadly enemies who compass me about. They are enclosed in their own fat. With their mouth they speak proudly. They have now compassed us in our steps. They have set their eyes, bowing down to the earth, like as a lion that is greedy of his prey, and as it were a young lion lurking in secret places. Arise, O Lord, disappoint him, cast him down. Deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword. From men, which are thy hand, O Lord. From men of the world, which have their portion in this life and whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure. They are full of children, and leave the rest of their substance to the babes. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. You see the difference there? Psalm 142.5 I cried unto the Lord. I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Psalm 119, 57. Thou art my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep thy words. We find Jeremiah hated, despised, persecuted. Did not have a good life on this planet. In Lamentations 3, 24, as he's lamenting the destruction of God's people. He says, The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. This is what it means to walk with God. Him being your portion. I was at Howells Anderson College. There was a lot of nice young ladies there, uh, all putting their best foot forward trying to get a preacher boy, which was better than a lot of the other girls who, out in the world who didn't care if they had a preacher boy or not. But there came a day when I decided that Angie Henson would be my portion. And she decided that Mark Bullen would be her portion. Okay? That means that all the other ones were off the list. And that means for her that all the other ones were off the list. She was my portion. That means I'm content. I'm content to have her and forget about options. Isn't that what it means with God? If God is your portion, then that's, that's my part. That's my allotment. That's my inheritance. The Bible uses all those words. The word of God choosing Israel for his inheritance. That means they were his portion. They were his people. And he wanted to be their God. Lot pursued self-advancement. Abraham pursued God. Lot pursued comfort, power, and prosperity. But he was still a just and moral man. Lot was not an immoral man. The Bible calls him a just man. He was an upright man. But what happened to his portion? It was stolen. After that, Abraham got it back for him. Did he change his ways? Did he learn anything? No. After that, his portion, being that it was also the portion of the wicked, was destroyed by God. His family was destroyed. You find two men... One man was providing for his family. The other man was also providing for his family. One saw his portion in God and wanted that to be his family's portion as well. The other one found his portion on earth 
in the way that humans would naturally perceive a better portion, right? Two outcomes could not be more different. There was a covenant relationship offered to Abraham. A claim on his life coupled with a promise. He would be God's. Everything he had would be God's. That's what paying tithe is all about, by the way. Abraham testified when he had all those riches. That was his. He recovered them. He was the leader. The king of Sodom understood that. He said, just give us the people. Take all the rest to yourself. But Abraham said, no, this is God's. He gave a tenth to Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God, and then gave the rest of it back to him. He testified by that, that he was God's, and everything he had was God's, and so what he did with it was whatever he thought would be pleasing and appropriate to God. He would be God's, and God would be his. God's presence and favor would be with him through life, and God's presence and favor would be a heritage which Abraham could bring upon his children. God would still be there for Abraham's children after Abraham was gone. Could money, fame, earthly power, possessions, or pleasures of this life offer such? Is there anything in this world that can offer to you not only that it would be Yours, your inheritance, and after you were gone, it would bless generation after generation after generation. Something that nobody could steal. <clears throat> Something that nobody could take away. What are you going to leave your children? <clears throat> Turn to Genesis 26. What are you going to leave your children? What heritage? In Genesis 26, Abraham's gone. Uh, verse 2. And the Lord appeared unto him, unto Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham's gone. Abraham's in the grave. His soul is with the Lord. But the Lord appears unto Isaac and says, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. God is guiding Abraham's son. Abraham can't do it anymore. Abraham grew old and feeble and died. But the Lord is there. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries. And I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because that Abraham obeyed my voice, and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. What are you going to hand to your children? What you're going to give to your children is what you have chosen as your portion. Because that's all you have to give. We find that because God was Abraham's portion... As long as Abraham remained in the, in the grace of God by keeping his charge, his commandments, and so forth, that after he died, he would have an experience of eternal existence with God. God was his portion, and so God said, so you're my portion. As many of Abraham's children followed his faith, they would also have that as their portion. In fact, heaven became known as Abraham's bosom in the Jewish mind. Everybody knew that because Abraham chose God as his portion, God chose Abraham as his portion, and all of his seed are in a covenant. Now Gentiles, Gentiles just following their parents didn't have this option. A Gentile person had to come into Abraham's seed, become a part of Abraham's seed by circumcision and whatever rites and ceremonies God had put upon them, they had to come into Abraham's covenant in order to get a part of that portion, that inheritance. <clears throat> Is there anything on earth, 
anything the world can offer you that has these qualities involved? In Psalm 49, it says, They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth forever, that he should still live forever and not see corruption. For he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish, and leave their wealth to others. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever, and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beast that perish. This their way is their folly, yet their posterity approve their sayings. Selah. Like sheep they are laid in, the grave, laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. And their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. Verse 15, But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. How did Abraham obtain such a position with God? Number one, when he took God as his portion, he became God's portion. This is an opportunity for everybody, thanks to God's uh, covenant with Abraham. God desires this relationship with all of those who have the faith of Abraham. God started something in Abraham, his relationship with Abraham, and he said, In thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. If they will follow your faith, if they will watch your example, and, be a, and they will choose you as their father and walk in the ways that you've walked, they can enter into this grand opportunity. And God says, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. He says, I will be a father to them, and they will be sons and daughters to me. And we find through the scriptures, God seeking this with Abraham's seed. Most of them missed out. But in Genesis 17, 8, uh, And I will give unto thee and thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. That's what the promise was. In Deuteronomy 26, 17, uh, Moses is saying to the children of Israel, Thou hast avouched the Lord this day to be thy God, and to walk in his ways, and to keep his statutes, and his commandments, and his judgments, and to hearken unto his voice. And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people, as he hath promised thee that thou shouldest keep all his commandments. When I decide I, I've got a life to live, I'm on planet earth, I have a free will. There's so many ways I can go. So many things I can pursue. My life is before me. And I say, I want God for my portion. The devil says, what, what about this? What about this? Look here. Look at there. Well, what about all these things? And I say, I want God as my portion. As a 15-year-old, I said, I want God as my portion. So when I went back to school, it was no more rodeo. It was no more cool dude. It was no more... I, I had set up... Uh, on a computer program in a work study class and we did a computer printout of what jobs made the most money and at that time a chemical engineer was way up there and I decided that's what I want to be I want to be a chemical engineer I want to make lots of money okay that's gonna be my portion but when I chose God is my portion I rearranged my schedule my computer class which was six period I dropped it and we had Bible club. We had Bible club at lunch and we had Bible club during the sixth period class. Those who had a different lunch, we had A and B lunch. Those who had the other lunch, they could, oftentimes the sixth period, a lot of people didn't even have a class then. And so uh, we started a Bible club in school. Instead of being a, a chemical engineer, I began focusing on being a preacher. Instead of taking uh, honors math courses, which I had been taking, uh, I focused on studying my Bible. I wanted to know God. I wanted to know His Word. I began memorizing Scripture. My focus, God is my portion. That doesn't mean you can't get an education and make a living. Abraham still had sheep and shepherd and, and had quite an operation going. But it was all geared 
to please God and to serve God and to be where God wanted him to be and to raise his family up to seek God. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 24, 7. God says here, I will give them a heart to know me. This is after he carries them to Babylon. That I am the Lord and they shall be my people and I will be their God for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. Read Nehemiah and you'll see that. Jeremiah 32, he says, And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever, for the good of them and for their children after them. Ezekiel 11, 20. That they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Ezekiel 37, 23. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols nor with their dwelling place, their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places, wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people, and I will be their God. Ezekiel 37, 27, My tabernacle also shall be with them, yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Zechariah 8, 8, And I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. Over and over and over, you'll find God talking about Israel as His inheritance. And when He gets frustrated with them one time, He tells Moses, I'm going to disinherit them, and I'll make of you a great nation. If you... If God is not good enough to be your portion, if you've got to have something else, then you, you, He will disinherit you as well. This is one of those kind of relationships where I will be all for you and you will be all for me. And it can't work on any other basis. In the church, we as Christian people, the Bible says, for as many as you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The promise we've been talking about. The same offer. The same opportunity. 2 Corinthians 6.16. Uh, the same one that wrote Galatians. The Apostle Paul says this. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them everything else, every other option, every other thing is your possible portion in this life, and be ye separate. Separate what? Separate unto me, God says. In other words, Angie Henson, renounce every other young man on earth. You're going to be mine. And I will be for you. And you will be for me. Till death do us part. That's the way it works. He says here, And you should be, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye should be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. How did Abraham obtain such a position with God? Number two, Abraham walked before God with a perfect heart. He was happy that God was his portion, and that was enough. He was content to let the world go by, let the parade go by. I want God for my portion. I don't have to have any of their portion. God is my portion. In Genesis 17, 1, when Abraham was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make thy, my covenant between me and thee. A continual reminder. And will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And in that context, those many nations, those all nations being blessed in him, was the gospel being opened to you and I. We can enter into this relationship with God through being a child of Abraham by faith in Christ Jesus. 
In Genesis 22, God tests Abraham. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, Abraham had taken his only son Isaac upon Mount Moriah and was willing to offer his only son. Why? Why, Abraham? Because Abraham knew that if, if I've chosen God as my portion, then I am his portion. And the only way to maintain him being my portion is for me to be his portion. If I deprive him of his portion, then I can't expect him to be my portion. It's, that's the way it works. He believed God. He wanted to please God. He didn't want anything more than God. And God says here, And hath not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. God says, I'm going to take you as my portion, because you have proven that I was your portion. We find that God... Uh, then we find the Lord watching over Isaac as we read after Abraham's gone. Have you ever heard Abraham's sermon? Y'all know Abraham preached a sermon? We'll turn to Luke chapter 16. I'll share with you Abraham's sermon. It's basically along this same line. Luke chapter 16, we'll begin reading in verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into what? Abraham's bosom. Okay, you know why that was so? Because that beggar, in life, I don't know what options he had. Oftentimes, people who are ill of health, poor, the Bible says the poor are rich in faith, oftentimes. And they choose God as their portion. Maybe they don't have as many options. The rich man... It's harder for him to get into heaven than a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Why? He has so many options. All of his money. So many options. He doesn't want to just choose God as his portion. But that poor man just making his way through, he wants God as his portion. And so, ill health, poverty, all those things can be a tremendous blessing if they help you to appreciate God as your portion. Well, they did with this sick man, Lazarus. And therefore, because God was his portion, he got to be God's portion. He was taken to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lifted his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, you want to hear Abraham's sermon? But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime chose your portion. Thou in thy lifetime, you chose your portion. You had a chance to choose God as your portion, but you chose riches, thy good things. You chose other things as your portion in life. And you received thy good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Now, did Lazarus go to heaven because he was poor, and the rich man go to hell because he was rich? No. Listen. And beside all this, between us and you there was a great goal fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them. What's he going to tell them? To get poor and sick? No. No, that wasn't the point. Okay? It may have aided in the point, but it wasn't the point. The rich man knew that Lazarus understood the problem. Maybe he had talked to him in life. Maybe Lazarus had witnessed to him. But how could this rich man listen to that guy? But what do you have to tell me about God? 
You know, look at me. I've got all the blessings. You've got all the cursings. Why should I listen to you about God? But Lazarus was probably saying, Mr. Rich Man, I've chosen God as my portion and you haven't. That's not going to go well with you someday. So he says, send Lazarus. He had, he had total confidence that Lazarus knew what to say. Okay? Send Lazarus that he may testify unto them. Lest they come also into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. What was Moses and the prophets going to tell him? And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Repent of what? Repent of choosing anything other than God for their portion. Repent of not honoring the faith of their father Abraham. Jesus is dealing with Jews here. He's preaching to Jews about Jews. No Gentile would say Father Abraham from hell, okay? This was a Jew that went to hell. This was the seed of Abraham that went to hell. And the reason he went to hell is because he didn't have the faith of Abraham. Though Abraham was his father, he didn't choose the portion in life that Abraham chose. He chose a different portion. He didn't honor the covenant that Abraham made with God. And so... Abraham says, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded the one rose from the dead. He, Abraham basically said, you got your portion and Lazarus got his. You chose your portion and Lazarus chose his portion and it has been delivered accordingly. Number three, Abraham commanded his children and household to walk with a perfect heart before the Lord. He set the example. He set his heart on God. And while Lot was moving off, everybody knew. All the boys knew. All the children knew. All the servants knew. Lot's going down there to those plush fields. But Dad, Father Abraham won't go down there because he knows how the men of Sodom are. He doesn't want us living by those guys down there. So he's going to keep us up here. It's a little harder up here. Boy, it'd be nice to graze our sheep down there. But Paul wants us to stay up here because we're not so close to Sodom. He kept his family away from that wicked city. Genesis 18. We have a little picture of God's viewpoint of the whole thing. God sent three angels. One of them was Jehovah himself and two other angels. We don't know exactly the arrangement there. And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. They were walking up on these hills looking down into this fertile valley. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him. That he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord. They will choose God as their portion. To do justice and judgment. That the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. What? And that is that all the nations of the earth should be blessed in him. All Abraham's children who took God as their portion in this life became God's inheritance. They became God's treasure. They became his people. And in the New Testament and the Old Testament both, the concept is they became his bride. His peculiar people, his inheritance, his portion. Ephesians 5.25 Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. Even as the great I Am loved His peculiar people. Even as Jehovah loved the, the children of Abraham who followed the faith of Abraham. That was His church. That was His church in the Old Testament. That's His church in the New Testament. Okay? And gave himself for it. Jehovah came down. The word became flesh. 
to redeem his bride. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. You notice he calls it an it. He gave himself for it. That he might cleanse it. That he might present it. What's the it? It's not me as an individual. It's me as a part of a congregation. It's the congregation of all those who've chosen God as their portion in this life. It's the congregation of all those who've chosen Christ, who've chosen His doctrine, who've chosen His Father, who've chosen the Scriptures, who've chosen God as their portion. What are you living for? You have in your mind an idea of what you want out of life. Are you willing to say, there's none on earth I desire beside thee, Lord. Thou art my portion. If I get you, I don't care what I lose. But if I don't get you, then I've lost everything. Is that your heart this morning? Is God your portion in life? Is that really what you are pursuing in life? The congregation of those who have chosen God as their portion, have those are His bride. Now you can't choose God as your portion without obeying Him, obviously. Without walking in His ways. You, you heard the verses. What Abraham did, he kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes. That was before the law of Moses was written. Okay? Abraham knew a lot about what God was like and what God wanted, and he did it. Before Moses' law was written. Abraham told uh, the rich man, your uh, brothers back home, they need to hear Moses and the prophets. Basically, that was their responsibility. If they wanted to have God as their portion, they had to hear Moses and the prophets. We have to hear Moses and the prophets and Jesus, the chief cornerstone. Jesus came as the mouthpiece of God. He's the one who was the mouthpiece of Moses and the prophets. He's the one who told the story to the Jewish people about Abraham telling them to listen to Moses and the prophets. That was Jesus' way of telling them how this is how you got to be saved. Here's a story that illustrates what you need to do. And that was listen to Moses and the prophets. That's what Jesus, uh, that was his uh, point in the whole message. In Acts 20, 28, the Apostle Paul is exhorting the Ephesian elders. He says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church, the ecclesia, the congregation of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Wherever that congregation of God is on planet earth, they form into congregations. They form into congregations following the pattern of the apostles, following what Jesus taught his apostles. By, by us forming ourselves into a congregation and operating according to God's program revealed in his scriptures, we are the, how else can we show him that you are our portion? If I move to get a good job instead of to get a good church, I'm declaring something to God. Mm -hmm. But if I move to get a good church and say we'll make a living somehow, I want a good church for my family. I want a biblical church. I want a biblical congregation. I want a biblical life. I want a biblical home. Well, don't you know you're going to miss out on this and this and this? It doesn't matter. God is my portion. Will you be a part of His portion? In Revelation, we find that in Revelation 19, And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye His servants, and ye that fear Him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, 
For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. His wife is all the saints, Old and New Testament. His congregation from Genesis to Revelation, all the way through the history of the earth, who have chosen him as their portion. And now they have been called out and assembled as his portion. They become his portion because he was their portion. That's what marriage is all about. I don't want her as my portion unless she's choosing me as her portion. That's the only way it can work. And then her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. You want to be a part of that? Oh man, that sounds great. All this is going to be burned up and gone. All it's going to be over with. And that's really what's going to matter. Yeah, I want to be a part of that. You can't choose it then. You got to choose it now while those well watered plains of Jordan are still there. God's got to be your portion. You know, my wife, she didn't say, hey, you know, uh, after we get out of college and there's no more opportunity to date around here, then I'll choose you as my portion. When all these other guys are gone, then would that have worked? Well, what if I had told her, you know, I'm in college, there's a lot of young ladies here, I'd like to meet a lot of them, and then. You know, after after I graduate and this no longer in this opportunity, uh, then I'll choose you as my portion. When the other options are gone, that gonna work? Is that what you want to do to God? You think God's gonna fall for that? Mm-hmm. Matthew six thirty one. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Even the necessities of life. Even the important things of this world. God says, don't pursue them. You pursue me. I'll help you work all that out. But I've got to be first. In Mark 8, 34. And when he called the people unto him with his disciples, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life, that's my portion, shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, God is your portion. In the Gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if you gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Oh honey, yeah, I'll take you as my portion, but I don't really want to be seen with you in public. You know, um, why don't we just keep that a secret? Would that work? That have been okay? That wouldn't have worked, would it? Whosoever therefore should be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Why? Because this adulterous and sinful generation do not appreciate him and his words. Mm-hmm. They showed what they thought about him and his words. Of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. That's appropriate. Mm-hmm. You don't want to be coupled with me in this evil, sinful generation? Then when all this is gone and the glory time comes, I won't acknowledge you. That's fair. Matthew 13, 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field. The which when a man hath found, he hideth. And for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. Who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. 
What is your pearl of great price? Is God so important that exceeding great reward? Do you see God as an exceeding great reward? He said to Abraham, I am thy exceeding great reward. Because God knew, Abraham, all the riches of Sodom and the well-watered plains of Jordan cannot even touch what I'm going to do for you. You've chosen me. You don't even understand at this point what that means. But when Abraham was sitting there with Lazarus in his bosom, he understood, didn't he? He's in glory. Why? You say, well, but, you know, I've had a really rough life. What is life? It is even a vapor that appears a little, for a little while and vanishes away. Those of us here are 50 and over, we know that. Like, where did it go? If God is your portion, it doesn't really matter what else happens in life. If God is your portion and you become a part of His portion, Everything else can go on by. That's really all that has value in this life. Looking back over 52 years, of course I could probably only look back over 50. I don't remember those other ones, but I remember when I was three. Looking back over 49 years. What value when God was my portion, life had meaning. But when God wasn't my portion, life was shallow. I just want to impress on you today. If you want to be His portion, if you want to be in that congregation called His bride, His peculiar people, where God says, this is my inheritance. This is my portion then you have to make Him your portion. Mm -hmm. That means this is, this is what I'm going to get in life, and that's okay. Yeah. This is what life is going to give me, and that's fine. I don't need anything else. If I have God, God is my portion, I'm happy with that. I don't have to know what they're doing. I don't have to know what they're getting. I don't have to know what they're experiencing. I don't have to know whether options there are. We're going to have a wedding coming up here for long. Are you concerned about any other options? I know. Like, you mean there's, a, you mean there's other girls on the planet? I, I forgot about that. You mean there are other young ladies on the planet? Oh, okay, well, hadn't thought about that lately. Right? Yeah. Hopefully we'll have another one coming up. It'll be this... Yeah. Are there any other young ladies on the planet? Hmm. Had, hadn't thought about it in the last few months, <laughs> weeks. What other options are there in life? I don't know. Hadn't thought about it. Oh, God is my portion. You mean there's something in life other than God? You mean there's something out there other than serving Jesus? Didn't, hadn't thought about it. Let's stand together. Any thoughts before we pray? Well, it just wish it was always that clear. Because the devil would like to get, believe that he who lived down there to, by uh, Sodom, he haven't forsaken God. You're still God's special person. You have a greater ministry opportunity there in Sodom. You'd be able to be one of the elders and think of how much good you could do there. Um, you can have them both. I mean, yeah, so you'd have a much bigger ministry than Abraham, right? Yes, and think of all the people of you, evil you could restrain, good you could enforce. So what is your portion then? It's, it's my ministry. But I'm doing it for God. <laughs> we'll see now that. 
you got to convince him of that. See. But it, it's interesting that we get to see where that story goes. It's like, well, Lot may have been able to maintain it, um, God's favor to some degree, but what, what happened to his children? We can look back and say, did Lot choose God as his portion? No, that wasn't what Lot was concerned about. That wasn't what Lot was pursuing. We can look at Abraham's life and see that Abraham was pursuing God. His family knew it. His servants knew it. Uh, even, even the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah knew it. They all knew Abraham. That's why, that's why Abraham said, I don't want you to say you made me rich. I want you to know that God gave me what I have. It was a testimony matter. Abraham was probably a prick in their conscience. And so if, they made, if, if he took all that stuff, they, it would ease their conscience. He didn't want any part of that. I've, I've, I've been in similar scenarios. I think it was also that God in His mercy was trying to convict the people of Sodom by giving them this testimony. All these things belong to me. I'm giving them back to you. Now what are you going to do with them? It's like, oh, right back to where we were. And, okay, Lot supposedly had a bigger ministry opportunity. But who had the real big ministry opportunity in Sodom and the cities there. It was Abraham who was off keeping himself right with God and was available to rescue them. And uh, yeah, that would have been a great ministry opportunity, but the people of Sodom didn't. So all that eat. becomes clear when we can step back and look at it from a distance or look at it from the end of their lifetime and see, oh, well, no, I see that in the long run it really worked out better. Um, so then our problem is when we start to wonder well, how much can we indulge or how much can we pursue other things and still have God. That's where the problem comes in. Right. And that's when our eyesight becomes blinded and, and we don't see the end of the picture yet. And by the time we do, it'll be too late. I want God as my portion. Yeah, this will enhance it. Yeah. And the thing with Lot is he wasn't going to Sodom to, for a ministry. We're just saying that as an excuse that many people use to achieve another agenda. Right. And they try to cloak it in this cloak. And the fact is, if he had truly been concerned about ministering to the people of Sodom, he would not have sacrificed the souls of his family and the influence there to ministry to be a ministry to something else. Him and Abraham would have went down there maybe once in a while and preached at him and Abraham back up into the mountain. And they would have made sacrifice possibly in concern for the sinners. And there would have been an appropriate way to have a ministry in that way if they wanted to do that appropriately. But they would not, what are you sacrificing under this cloak of, I'm doing it for ministry. It's like, look at all, you're going to lose, you're losing souls that are right in your care here to minister. It's like, no, I'm sorry, that's, that's a cloak. That's not what you're really doing this for. Right. And, and so ministry is good, and it's good to be willing to sacrifice for God and minister, and that's our duty. But don't sacrifice uh, other things that are more important, and don't do it. Don't use that as your cloak to get your other agendas accomplished. Because when God is your portion, <clears throat> if God is your portion, it may destroy your ministry. Okay, look at Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah was pleasing God, and it destroyed him as a priest. His ministry as a priest was destroyed because society did not see him as God's prophet. They saw him as an imposter, as a, you know, against the nation. And so, but that was okay with Jeremiah. Jeremiah realized they don't understand. They don't want to hear what I have to say. But God is my portion. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. But it's only in that state of mind that you are in any condition to minister right, to right. people. Because Otherwise, then you have something to offer. You have something to give. Well, there's a lot of ministers of Satan, and they've got a lot of ministry going on, and it's a very successful ministry, but it's for the wrong uh, captain or for the wrong person. There were likely a number of successful churches or temples in Noah's town. And uh, apparently it was foregoing some opportunity there, but they weren't worth saving. Right. Lot could have found ways to appeal to his neighbors, and be more inviting and welcoming, but he didn't. Daniel the prophet didn't um, 
he wasn't seeking Daniel's his own heritage, his own legacy. Okay, it's, it's all going to come out in the wash. If God is your portion that you have chosen, you, you can say to him, I desire nothing beside thee. I want you. I'm seeking first your kingdom and your righteousness. You are my portion, regardless of what that cost or price tag is. God will know. Eventually, everybody else will know. And that will determine whether you are his portion 